Well, kia ora koutou, ko ea koutou ki ingoa. Uh, thank you so much for everyone um, today joining us on this session about what we learned from our uh, recent unconference. Um, it was a very, very new experimentation um, where volunteer organisers came together who are passionate about um, the theme and also the purpose. And so today, the session is all about us sharing our learnings. And so what we'll do um, is that uh, I will screen share um, and, and we will go for it. Cool. So as you know, the Aotearoa's first virtual unconference was about a month ago. And so um, it was led by Stephen Moe, who I will pass on now to share the purpose and overview. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Erica. And it's a delight to have you all joining us virtually once again. Um, yeah, it's such an amazing use of technology that we can all meet this way. Um, I, my purpose is just to share really briefly the background to the unconference and what we were aiming for, which I already see some of the chat questions are coming up. Um, the other thing is I am recording this just so everybody knows. Um, and the, the reason for doing that is that we like to use technology so that those who said that they wanted to be here but couldn't make it for various reasons, they'll be able to watch this afterwards. Um, so the impact on conference, it, it kind of came about, um, i had been organizing some lunches here in Christchurch and getting 30 or 40 people along to what I've been calling impact lunches. So there was already kind of a cohort of people who were meeting. This is over the last two years or so. And I've been running a podcast called Seeds, um, again, interviewing people, going a bit deeper with them. And so I was just in my mind thinking, wouldn't it be great if we could gather more people together and have more conversations and hear more perspectives? Um, so about now, probably a year ago, I had this idea of doing an unconference, an in-person unconference that would be held here in Christchurch in May of 2020. So everything um, started from that seed, and I was reaching out to people, um, gathering a core group of people who wanted to help, and we were pretty much ready to run it in May of 2020 as an in-person. We had venues, we were working on food and catering and all that stuff, and then COVID-19 happened, and so that all just went overnight, this is not gonna happen. So then it was just this case of, well, could we do it online? Could we run it in a way that was still able to be done? And so on the 2nd of April, um, I remember clearly doing an email and sending an email to the people who'd supported it so far and saying, what do you think? Could we pivot here? Could we try doing it online? And enough people said, we're willing to give it a go. Um, so that was really the origins. Um, so I guess it's important, one of the things is that it wasn't like we started on the 2nd of April from nothing. Like we had had the website up for months and we'd already thought through how we might structure it, different topics, who might be involved. So that gave us a real head start. So the turnaround was really impressive from 2nd of April to the 24th of April, but we did have a big head start of already having a Slack channel we had volunteer groups going and things. And then the reason um, I'd been to several social enterprise unconferences, so I knew the format. Um, and I really liked the idea of going grassroots and collaboratively sharing with each other, not, not necessarily having, well, this expert's at 10 o'clock and this expert's at 11, instead going out to the crowd and sourcing, what are we gonna talk about? And um, so that was the reason why the model of an unconference was what we were using. Um, and then the word impact for me um, just resonates at, on so many levels. And I, I'm sure those of you are on this agree um, because it isn't just about social impact. You know, sometimes we get caught up with social enterprise, but impact itself covers environment, you know, culture, people, work, all types of things. So it was really trying to say, could we gather together in an online format and um, hear, from, hear from our peers, hear from people that we've voted on in terms of the topics and, um, and see what results. And I really viewed it as an experiment more than anything um, in some way. It was just, 
could we do it? Could we run it? Um, to have six different Zoom rooms, to have about 350 people. So all the time we kept saying things um, like, we'll just try it, we'll have a go. And I think we learned a lot. So today's session, we, we just want to each share with you some of the key things um, from each of our expertises. But that hopefully sets a bit of the scene or the background as to how we got to today in sharing with you. Cool, thanks Stephen. And as many of you might know, we collaborated on this document, um, which is a free handbook. It's a comprehensive guide to um, everything that we have in terms of resources and, and team structure and um, how we collaborated and also topic um, selection. And you can download this on our website. Uh, it's a 79 page document. Uh, so again, just um, uh, letting you know that it is quite comprehensive. So do take the time um, to, to look at that. Uh, and thanks to the organizers who have put um, together and many of the, the co-authors of this um, guide will share some of the knowledge um, today. So the format of today is that the core team will do their presentation uh, and we will actually break out into um, breakout rooms um, depending on how many are on this call and we will have a question and answer time um, just to make sure that we cover um, most of the questions that, um, that you ask and prepared today. So Stephen, all right, Hannah, would you like to cover the team structure and culture? Sure, uh, kia ora koutou, um, ko hana toko ingoa. Um, so I actually joined the team probably one of the last. Um, I was not involved at all in, in as uh, Stephen was talking about the original plans for the actual non-virtual unconference, but I had taken part in the uh, an event in Australia, uh, a digital event in Australia without going to Australia, the Digital Storytellers uh, Social Enterprise Unconference just a few weeks prior to um, to this uh, event and it was smaller and quicker and dirtier than this one even it was for 100 people and it was organized from start to finish in a week and goodness we learned a lot so when i saw that this was happening um here in new zealand i thought well you know there's an obvious opportunity to put some of those learnings into place um, and what struck me from the beginning um in terms of working with these guys and I still have not met most of them in person which I think is quite extraordinary in itself. I'd, I'd always believed that in order to really work well with people you've got to spend time together and all of that and I think this experience has proven that that is not the case. Um, and what I think contributed to that was uh, the warmth of the, the welcome and the invitation just to dive in and uh, contribute what you think you can. Um, and so from the first Zoom calls, I mean, you can, you can see how Stephen and Erica host things. It's with a lot of warmth and welcome. Um, it became very uh, easy just to kind of find a way to contribute. My contributions were, were welcome from the start um, around the kind of participant experience piece in particular. Um, so Erica's just put up a wee slide here that kind of shows the vague, I would say sort of quite loose teams that formed. We weren't very strict on who did what. It was more like, what can you do? Okay, go do it. Um, and uh, so this sort of t team of 10 to 15 of us um, organized ourselves primarily on, on Slack. Uh, we had a very good sort of system of different channels so that not everybody knew everything all of the time. There was no email overload. Um, and I think our sort of vibe on Slack is, it's funny that this should be important, but there was a lot of kind of, high-fiving, thank you, that's great, this looks amazing. And it just, uh, for new people coming into a team and for people who are not sitting right next to each other and able to make cups of tea for each other and, and things, that really um, meant a lot, actually. Um, and I think, um, given that we didn't have that much time, uh, I think that was really uh, important to have a kind of a, a good strategy to uh, collaborate together because this was um, quite a complex uh, project as we're probably going to discuss. Um, later on we're going to come into the team structures for the actual conference but um, so I, I might say another couple of words then. 
Um, but I think the only other point I'll mention at this point is having some key principles, and these are outlined in the document for how we work together. One of ours was keep it simple, and I think that was the main um, organizing principle we kept coming, coming back to um, whilst uh, organizing together. So I'll, I'll just leave that there for now. We um, can maybe say a bit more about it later. Cool. So um, back to me. So my role in the unconference was the curation and project management. I'm just going to show you uh, the Google folder that we've set up. So when I was um, first um, being invited to join the group uh, was um, a in-person unconference, but I didn't have a lot of time to contribute at that time. Uh, and when it pivoted to this virtual space, I was like, okay, right, my two top skills was um, curation and project management. So the first thing I did was um, I started this uh, Google Drive um, with um, different folders for different important documents to, um, to be dropped in. Uh, and also the most important document that we used is um, the master planner um, spreadsheet. And as you can see down the bottom, we have different tabs um, for different purposes. Uh, and these could be contributed uh, by any member of the organizing team, whether it's the core team or the roaming team, um, uh, to contribute. And this is just a one place that we can just dump all our thoughts and our ideas and our processes uh, and then collaborate um, online. Uh, it doesn't have to be a Google folder. It could be a, um, a Microsoft Teams, a few... Um, uh, use that in your organization. Um, again, it's just one place where everyone um, is is familiar with the tech and comfortable with using um, the, the program uh, and being able to collaborate um, rapidly. So I jump back into... Oh, how do I do... All right, so on the day we, we worked on this schedule wireframe and as you remember, um, we talked about a lot around inviting speakers, which is sort of your normal conference format. The reason why we did keep that in the unconference format was one, it was a quick turnaround. We didn't actually know who will attend. And so we shoulder tapped some, um, some amazing speakers that we know um, that would contribute to the conversation. Uh, we actually started with only four columns. Uh, and then we decided that, hey, it's actually really important to, um, to make connections in the spiritual space. And so we created the wider uh, room specifically for connections. And Natasha uh, Zimmerman, who can't make it today, um, was the curator for that specific room where she invited different facilitators to facilitate uh, um, different exercises and activities focused on connection, uh, which Hannah and Stephen will touch on a bit later. And you can see across all of the rooms, we had the activation uh, uh, section. And the reason for that is um, from a curation side of things, um, we really focused on the emotional journey um, of the participants throughout the day. And we know that people um, get zoomed out. And so what, what we thought might be really good is to um, one, support the local uh, young artists and musicians uh, that can use their, their skills um, to fill the space but also being able to just have a breather, have a space uh, where you can just take a, take a, um, uh, take a walk or you know, uh, make a cup of tea without feeling too stressed about missing out on specific content. And you can now see the, the ones that are in blank are the sessions that we filled with the topics that are submitted by the participants. One thing that we've learned through the curation of the, the whole event was that we started thinking about um, the submission process. And we did that also in a rapid process where you can see on day one, we had a submission briefing, um, Zoom, where we had all the participants who wanted to submit a topic um, join uh, to collaborate uh, and, and dump their ideas. Um, but then we had the second day, which had um, the finalization of topics, where before this had happened, 
uh, the participants and the hosts were um, encouraged to find co-hosts uh, from the pool of participants that had similar um, topics or issues that they wanted to discuss. And the third day we had the voting and curation process where um, people had voted in um, and we would put the similar topics and also um, different topics around into the wireframe and the program was released. And the Friday, which is the fourth day, was the unconference. But after reflection, we thought one, um, because it was a virtual unconference, there was a lot of um, comments and, and um, reflection around how do we actually build trust um, uh, between the co-hosts. So upon reflection, uh, this is sort of the proposal for potentially the next uh, event that we want to put on, is that we would actually put the submission process in the Friday and then have the weekend for people to actually combine ideas, find hosts, build trust, and then finalize topics with their co-hosts before submitting on the Monday. And this allows more conversation um, and more, um, again, connection with, with the participants. And then the voting will happen with the curation and then we'll give another extra day for the program design. Um, and one thing that we were really focused on was that we had specific roles in each of the rooms, which Hannah will touch on later, but um, each of the facilitators of each room were to contact all of the kōrero starters or the co-hosts of the sessions. And that also needed a bit more time. So an extra day would really help with that process. Again, it's building trust and also supporting those people who aren't familiar with facilitation and giving them enough support um, to be able to feel comfortable and confident on the day of delivery. And the seventh day, uh, the program will be released and then the eighth day we'll have the unconference. The last thing that I wanted to talk about was that we used Miro uh, as a online collaboration tool where people can submit and uh, collaborate on ideas uh, and also comment on um, each other's post-it notes. The only thing um, that we would change is that at the time we were only using the free um, version uh, and that meant that everyone who's joined the Miro board got notifications and was bombarded with notifications. So if we were going to do it again, um, we would definitely upgrade uh, so that we can have um, uh, anonymous uh, sub uh, contributors to the board that won't actually trigger uh, notifications. Cool. So that's my bit. I think it's, we'll pass it on to you, Jesse. Kia ora koutou. Uh, thanks so much, Erica. Uh, so, yeah, my role in the Unconference team was to um, facilitate communications. Uh, there was quite a lot of communications that had to go out to our participants. Um, we didn't have to do quite as much on the marketing side of things. We were really fortunate because of all the mahi that Stephen had put in with building up a really fantastic network of supporters for the in-person Unconference. Um, that basically we already had a mailing list of people who were interested in the concept of an in-person one. So Stephen sent out an email explaining about the flip to online. Um, that generated quite a lot of interest. We used LinkedIn and Facebook to sort of share among our own networks. Uh, we had 60 people on a Slack channel who were all interested in supporting it and they shared it through their networks as well. So we found that in terms of actually getting the word out there, um, that kind of style of communications worked really well. And we sold out, I think it was on, was it the Monday before the event, Stephen? Yeah, I think it was. I was, I remember I was posting in the Slack chain saying this many sold, this many sold. And it was like, oh, that's it. They're all gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it sold out really quickly. Um, so then we very much have shifted focus to making sure that the communications with our participants were really clear. Um, we thought that was really important because it's a totally different format of event. Um, the unconference style, a lot of people aren't as familiar with, and then you put an unconference online, and it was kind of a totally new thing. So trying to explain that to participants and make sure they really understood what was going on, how they could be involved, um, and make sure everyone was on board with that was really important. Um, so yeah, we, that meant we sort of sent out emails almost every day in that week leading up to the unconference. Uh, we've included all of the copy that we used in those emails and a bit more of an explanation about what that was all about. 
in the book. Um, you'll see on page 21 and in Annex 4, all of that is there. Um, I don't know if we've mentioned this already, but the idea is if any of that sort of stuff is useful to any of you, please feel free to, to use it. <laughs> um, don't feel like you have to get permission or anything like that. Um, but yeah, that's that's the, the communication side of things. Um, key challenges we found where it was really time consuming and fiddly to update our MailChimp mailing list before every email was sent out and then catch up people who hadn't received the previous ones. That was a really manual process because obviously people were purchasing tickets all the time. Got a lot easier once we sold out and we could just say our mailing list was complete. Um, but there's a few different ways you can set up MailChimp to automatically send out emails to new um, people as they join. So I'd definitely look into that if I was doing something like this again. Um, and there's also ways you can send tickets through. We were using Humanitix as our ticketing platform, which is a really fantastic um, platform where the fees go towards supporting um, nonprofit edu education organizations. Um, so they were an awesome platform and you can actually send emails direct from them as well. So that's something we'd look into um, too. But yeah, I think that's that's kind of it on the communication. Oh, and social media, we, we had Hafsa, who's actually on this call. She was really great at helping with um, doing some different posts. So I would definitely recommend if you're doing something like this, having different voices kind of contributing to and helping with um, spreading the word is, is really valuable as well. And that brings me on to the on the day roles, um, which Hannah touched on before. But basically what we wanted to do was create Zoom rooms that were very, very welcoming, um, where people kind of knew what they were there for and felt comfortable coming in uh, because of the structure of the day, people would be coming in and out of rooms sort of all of the time. There was a question that came up um, about the, the two feet concept. Like, so if you're not vibing with a session, we kind of set the, set the expectation that you could leave, go into a different session. Uh, so we really had to make sure that we were curating those spaces in a way that was really welcoming throughout the day. So with that in mind, we had a weaver in each room. So they were there to basically hold the space, create the connection, identify um, connections that were coming up and to drop different notes and thoughts into the collaborative documents that we had for each session. Those weavers were also responsible for getting in touch with our Cordero starters. So those are the people who had submitted topic ideas and would be facilitating each, each session. Um, so the weavers really sort of held, held the space together. Um, our technicians, we had a technician in each room um, there to do the all important tech side of things. So muting participants, unmuting participants, setting up breakout rooms, helping to troubleshoot anything that might have been going wrong. Um, so the technician and the Cordero starter for each room worked really closely together to make sure that they were creating that space. Uh, we also had activators. So as Erica mentioned in the curation section, each room had one activation session in the afternoon. And that, the idea of that was to showcase some local um, amazing musicians and poets and also to give everyone a bit of brain space. Uh, the sessions were all fairly intense and the pace was really quick. Um, so a lot of our um, feedback was around the fact that people really appreciated having that time to just stop, listen to some music, run off and grab a drink, go to the bathroom, all of that kind of stuff, which you can, is always built into an in-person conference event. So we were really trying to create that space, but without losing people. And I think that's one of the challenges in the, in the online space is how to keep people engaged without overloading them. Um, so that's one way we tried to achieve that. Uh, we also had the connectors, uh, which Hannah will talk about a bit more, but that was a whole room dedicated to connection, facilitated um, by Natasha Zimmerman from Unchatter. Uh, we had a wellbeing ambassador, that was Fiona Dean. And the idea of that was to have someone external who participants could contact if they had any concerns come up. Um, there's obviously a lot of space for vulnerability and deep conversations in these kind of events. So we really wanted to make sure that people had a support person if they needed one. Um, and then similarly, the tech support person, Jess Ducey, she was there for anyone who couldn't get into Zoom 
um, or had trouble accessing the platforms. And then, yeah, our opening and closing speakers. Um, we had Anton Matthews um, did an incredible welcome for us in the opening session. Um, Stephen did some um, a fantastic sort of setting the scene. And we had Nicola Patrick in the closing session as an external person who participated to help us all reflect together. Um, and there's a bit more detail on that in the book as well. Thank you, Jesse. Hannah. So I'll just briefly say the reason we had this dedicated connection space is that this, for all of us involved, and I, I hope you're, as you're listening, you're getting the sense of the team that was involved in pulling this together. Like each of us, it was really important that this wasn't just another conference, that it wasn't just sort of, I heard some content and then I went away. We actually wanted to try to build connection and community. And so I was talking with Natasha Zimmerman, um, who's fantastic at doing this through Unchatter, which I encourage you to check out. Um, and, and we were talking and, and she said, what if we had this room, you know, dedicated connection space? So Hannah's gonna guide us through that bit, but I just wanted to give that preamble of this was really important to us. In a way, I viewed it as sort of the soul of the unconference, like it was really important that we do this. Yeah, I think, um both Natasha and I, this is a, a, a subject we're particularly passionate about and, and work towards in our own working lives. And we had a, a really interesting uh, sort of startup conversation about, well, you know, what is connection and how do you do it? Are we trying to connect people with their like professional hats on or is it just like a space you can go to not be listening, but to be really engaging uh, on quite a deep level with other people who might be there? And I think there was something beautiful about the online space that I hadn't really appreciated before COVID came along and sideswiped us all, that by going online, you are taking away the, the geographic um, nature of participation. So the fact that you're in a, a little village somewhere rural is not a barrier to taking part. You don't have to get on a bus or drive a car or a plane to, to come and uh, connect with other people who may be interested in the same sorts of topics. So I think uh, what we really wanted to to do with with this room was create a an area where people could could have some quite deep and fascinating uh, conversations. It was it was a, a smaller space, I suppose, as as I don't know if that's the right words, but not as many people came as came to the uh, workshop sessions. But those who did, uh, I think, were really touched by some of the work uh, that Natasha and her colleagues. Uh, so there were five or six different sessions. Each one had a theme, different type of activity. There was playfulness. There was quietness. There was nostalgia. Uh, people went into breakout rooms and had different activities. Maybe some of you took part. Um, it was just a way of being with each other that was engaging with something that was not your, your cognitive brain. Um, so it was, I, I hosted that room and uh, saw a lot of the feedback coming through and, and talked to people there. It was, it was really lovely to have that invitation, I think. And what I would say is that it, it felt like the, just the tip of the iceberg of what we think could be possible with this um, type of work in the online space. Um, my personal perspective is that there are different um, layers of connection. You know, there's the kind of joining in the first place, like discovering each other, who you are, and then there's a sort of developing place and there's a deepening place. And there are all sorts of activities that uh, you could run, you could develop, uh, with people without being in person. And I think Natasha and I both really wanted to explore this more. We really wanted also to have another room that was a bit like, you know, when you just meet people in the, in the queue for the bathrooms at conferences, you know, total serendipity and you sometimes have those amazing conversations. How do you do that online? Um, so we, we really kicked around a lot of other ideas as well. And uh, so anyone who wants to talk to either of us about those, uh, please, please reach out. Uh, it just felt really important to have um, have some depth um, to some of the conversations. And I, I think it will be really interesting maybe to reflect in a few months or a year later to find out what came of those um, conversations, how people connected um, afterwards, what they learned about each other. 
because uh, this space wasn't all about wearing your professional hat, which I thought was really interesting. People just came along and talked about how they like to play when they were young or whatever, um, and what's possible when we meet each other um, in, in that space. Um, so, uh, yeah, was there anything anyone else wanted to add about, about the connection piece? Team. I think we had elements of connection in the other rooms as well and the way that we did the breakout rooms and trying to facilitate the smaller group conversations as well. Um, I know I personally ended up in a breakout room with someone I connected with just like that and we're now good friends and we've never met. So um, yeah, I think having connection as one of the underpinning concepts and letting that sort of try to permeate all of the rooms and all of the sessions in different ways was a key thing, I think, of what made it quite a unique experience. Cool. Thank you. So, um, Camille Young can't make it today, but I will cover um, the program design. And so when we were first talking about uh, creating an online program for people to be able to um, opt in into sessions, uh, we came up with a really simple template. But as we um, move forward uh, closer to the unconference, we realized that we actually needed to um, give a bit more um, uh, time uh, to really think about what um, information were needed to include in the program and so this is just one of the pages in the program uh, where we took elements from all of the different submissions uh, and um, and uh, designed um, a, a program. But as you can see up on the top, you can see that there are um, places where you can uh, have Zoom links and in each of the rooms we also had a um, a link to a collaborative notes um, place where people can um, collectively take notes and also make connections um, online post event. Um, but what made it easy for this process was when we did the submission process, uh, we asked all the participants who'd like to submit a topic to actually give us a detailed uh, description uh, of their session. Uh, and also um, and also around what type of um, session that might be. It might be a, a workshop, it might be a circle chat, uh, it might be a conversation, um, or it might be unpacking with everyone um, around a specific topic. And so uh, the one page uh, program ended up being a multi-page program, um, which also included things like the code of conduct uh, and the um, the contact details to the well-being uh, ambassador, as well as tech support. And so people can access this online program um, without having to um, uh, be concerned about certain aspects that they don't know about or needing to jump onto a website um, to find out more details. Uh, the other benefit of having a digital program is that um, we were able to embed it into the, uh, the communications um, uh, stream which meant that uh, people can just click onto a link and access the, the program. Uh, and what we also did on the day was we encouraged people to um, go back to this program by uploading it um, using the file um, button to upload into each of the Zoom rooms so people can access and download the digital program online. Uh, and because it's a digital program, we don't need to think about timelines for printing, uh, which made it, again, um, really easy to uh, make it into a fast, rapid um, pace uh, so people can um, get into it quicker. Cool. Technology, Dennis. Kira Toto. Well, um, I was one of the original um, unconference planning members and I'm seeing the transition from the physical to a virtual unconference. We started on April the 2nd and were able to select the technology and had all working in just three weeks, which is pretty amazing, really. Um, as a Zoom Pro license holder, I also became um, one of the techie supports for and the virtual host for one of the virtual rooms. Now, shifting from a conference to an unconference required reframing on who decides and how things get done. Um, it's the same with the use of technology. There was a, a reframing um, re required on how people communicate and how they relate. 
Um, so the selection of the of the apps was quite important, and I note that um, there's already been one question on that. A lot of the apps were from our personal experience. Um, Zoom for video meetings, Humanitex for the bookings, MailChimp for external communication, Slack for internal communication, Google Apps of Drive, Docs, Sheets and Slides as planning apps, Miro for team planning. It was quite mesmerizing watching how that one grew. Um, website apps as an information hub, uh, mail apps for basic communication, um, and then Facebook and LinkedIn for, for communication. And we're all able to participate on our computers, tablets, and smartphones. Um, and, and interesting to note that apart from the room host needing a presumed pro license, all the apps chosen were free. So the cost for us for, um, for participants was no cost. Oh, okay, we did charge $5. But the, the cost for us for being able to put the whole, th whole thing on was really basically our time. Um, there was some discussion of some of the apps and some ideas came up, but I think through trial and error, um, but mostly from our own personal experience, we're able to very carefully um, have that group of apps and they worked very well together. Zoom, of course, became the pivotal app as this was our unconference delivery app. Now, I wrote a, um, a personal experience which appears in Annex 17 on what we learned. And, and the reason why I, I, I wrote uh, my personal experience is that I wanted to situate people on the inside of the event so people knew what it felt like and they could join in within the, the learnings. And one of the key things was that technology seamlessly worked in the background. Um, I, I worked very closely with the Weaver. Um, we met maybe half an hour before the whole thing started and we just chatted through uh, what we wanted to do, what we wanted to do and how, make, how things worked. And that was really valuable, excellent, and excellent preparation time. And I'd really recommend that that um, the more you talk about it with with your fellow presenters, the the better you'll be able to face the situations as they occur. Um, in the first session, and really to be honest, throughout the whole thing, I really could not concentrate on the content. I was very much focused on the on the delivery and the technical aspects of it. So. I've been able to go back and listen to some of the presenters, even those that I was the techie host for, because you, you just really have to focus very much on what was going on here and now. And, and when it started in the rooms, I was very aware that I'm sitting at my re remote desk. I could look around and I could see my, my bike behind me and my bookcase. But then I could see 25 people at the, t at the same time and they were alive and they were moving. And that gave me a really great sense of, of connectedness. And, I'm sure that would be the same feeling that all the attendees had because it was it was real and live. So timing was paramount. We had very tight 30 minute sessions. So it was really critical that we were prepared for each change. And even though we'd written quite good notes on what to do, of course, in the moment, and when you haven't had the experience of doing it before, um, things don't work out as expected. So first session, I made the wrong person the co-host. Um, had to have some quick chats and interventions um, and, the, and the, the, the Weaver, the Carrero and myself, we recognised that we had become a team in trying to work out how to solve this problem and also noticed that the participants were watching with amusement and so there was a feeling that the participants had become part of the delivery team and it was a really good feeling to know that um, even when things weren't working as, ex as expected, it still was able to, to happen. And there were other kinds of issues throughout where we had someone didn't follow the chats properly and I had to turn um, unmute and say, well, no, we need to do this, not that. But the technologies, the Zoom technologies were, for, were forgiving. Near enough was good enough. Um, and so a few um, observations I've made from a technology perspective, um, and this, this is from a technology perspective and not from a content learning, because as I said, I had no time to absorb. This virtual conference would not have been possible for us, for us to carry out in the past. Uh, the technology just worked. It was forgiving on our lack of experience and lack of expertise. Seeing all the live faces on the screen enhanced feelings of connectedness. Um, group oral and visual communication did not depend on technology experts. We didn't need to be mechanics. We were the drivers. Um, the experiential learning process was more important than the suggested improvements in the end. 
Yes, suggestion improvements are important, but actually doing it in itself was a very invaluable learning experience. And we gained valuable insight into the emergence of new social formations and organizational practice. And the nature of an unconference fits very well into this virtual and connected, um, interconnected world. So that's me, thank you. Thank you. Libby. Kia ora tato. Um, ko Libby toko ingoa. Um, my role was evaluating the unconference and I joined the team really late and I can speak to how welcoming and wonderful you guys all are. I feel part of the team even though I joined the week before. Um, I came to this because I was going to be a participant but I also came to this as a student. I'm doing a Bachelor of Leadership for Change and so this is part of my my, my course. So there was no cost to the unconference for the evaluation work that I'm doing. Um, I, in, the, in the learnings book there is a page with all of this, all of the, this, the main themes, the top themes, the but I want to talk about some of the particular themes. Um, the thing that people en enjoyed the most, um, I want to talk about the sub themes because I think they bring out some interesting things that people wanted, that one of the things that people really enjoyed, apart from the themes that are on the page in the book, is was connecting and was not just connecting, but having deep, meaningful connections in the breakout rooms, um, which I, th I thought was really interesting and that the technology made it possible. That was also a strong sub, sub theme. Um, people really liked the, the, the music and they also liked being able to dip in and out of sessions and they also liked the breakout rooms. In terms of improving, um, I want to dig into this one a little bit too. There were themes like better preparation of the pre presenters and the presenters delivering delivery of sessions, which um, is only something that you can find out by doing. And we found out by doing. Um, People wanted more time for reflection. That was a strong theme that came through in the survey um, under several different topics. And they wanted better planning to enable connection to others. So that, that links back to the what did they enjoy in the connecting. Um, under the collaborating further uh, item, Digging into that, um, there was people talking about taking learning back to their community. That was a really, really strong sub theme that came out when I did further analysis. Taking the learnings back to their communities, wherever their communities are. There was a lot of people that were at the conference that were from other places, not Christchurch and particularly regional places. So they're taking the, the learnings that they did back to their communities and particularly um, in community-led design that was mentioned several times and looking at how they can measure the impact of what they're doing. Um, as, and the other, the other thing that came up in terms of collaborating further was people wanting to change narratives out there in the world and how powerful stories are in changing those narratives. There were some reasons why people didn't want to collaborate um, and the main one was no time. They just don't have any time in their lives, which is understandable. But um, there was also a theme of nothing engaging me, which was also linked to the fact that you could only go to so many sessions and therefore maybe there were other things that might have engaged you. And again, you couldn't actually find that out until you did it. In the action pledge, which was something that we asked people to do, what would they be doing in six months? What's their action pledge? 
um, one of the interesting things that came out of that was, again, collaboration. They would be collaborating with, following, disseminating the work of a particular presenter. There were several presenters that were mentioned, so the presenters being the, the courier or starters. And I thought that was that was interesting. That there's a theme that's emerging from the sub themes, which is all about connection and collaboration, which is brilliant because that's what we were what we were about. And that's me. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I will exit the screen share so I can see everyone's beautiful faces. Um, one of the things that we did talk about was whether we should split up into two breakout rooms um, where you can engage with the organisers. That means that there will be more questions answered. Um, Stephen, do you, what, what, are, what are your thoughts? Whether we should stick with one or yeah. break out? Well, we're at 30 right now. Um, we have a few questions which have come up in the chat. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if we should run through the answers to those first. Okay. Does that make sense? While we're all together? Sure. And then let's do that. Let's see. Because we're, we're conscious that people will have, you know, things to go to and, and other things. So feel free to leave at any time as well. Um, but we do want to answer any questions that we can. We're making ourselves available. So um, should we just run through those quickly? Does that sound like a good plan? All right, what was the most time consuming activity when organizing the conference, which took longer than you thought? Mm. I think all of it. <laughs> like I, I vividly remember saying, yes, let's do this. And my, the, ro the paid role I was working on at the time was coming to an end and then I jumped straight into this and it ended up turning into almost a full-time job for the three weeks leading up to it. Um, just because, yeah, everything just takes a bit longer than you think, and when you are doing it on such a tight time frame, and we had pretty bold ambitions as well. Um, so I think all of it took, like the communication side, the curation side, um, working out what the settings we needed to use for Zoom were, took a long time of trialing and error and all of that. Um, so yeah, the the whole thing takes longer than you think when you're trying to execute something you've never done before at a high quality level. Um, is what I would say. So take how long you think it will take and maybe double it and you should be right. And a specific example was the program design. We thought it, um, we were able to get all the information um, and put it in a beautifully laid out template in under two hours. Um, it was meant to be sent out to everyone at 12 p.m. on the Thursday, but it ended up being sent out, I think, uh, um, at 6 p.m because we were, we were putting in a lot of content and a lot of information into a beautifully designed template and making sure that the Zoom links were working and testing it out before um, we inserted into that. Yeah, and I think the flow on from all those points is to build in enough time. You know, don't, don't put yourself under pressure if you don't need to. Like, we, we probably keep more pressure on ourselves than we actually needed to by committing to doing this by this date. So just build in an extra day or so, or build in a few more hours and things. Um, yeah, I'd agree with everything the others have said. We'll just run through the questions quickly though. So what are some ways to go about to catalyze connections stemming from the unconference going forward? I'm not sure if we have really touched on it, but we did have a Google document for each session and we encourage people to enter in their contact details and their information and to also say how they would like to be involved. Uh, it would be fascinating now actually to go back and talk with each of the, the people who led the sessions and say what's come as a result. I know some of them have contacted everyone who attended their sessions and, and bounced ideas around. Um, Fiona sent me a paper that she's written yesterday based on what she learned from doing that, you know, that session. So there's definitely flow on impacts. Um, but part of it, I do believe, is we won't know for a long time. Like, I didn't know that Jesse met somebody who she's now a friend with, but that's kind of cool. Um, so there's going to be a lot of that stuff that we won't see for months or maybe years um, to come and collaborations that result. So that would be my response to that. Uh, but we did try through the Google Docs to connect people who were interested in the topics. And then, uh, yeah, what actions and initiatives have come out of the unconference and what Kara said. Um, 
Well, does anybody else want to say anything? I know I've had several, lots of emails from people saying, thank you so much for the guide. We can use this in other contexts. Um, we've had a lot of feedback from people saying, I'm zoomed out of, of conferences, but your one really stood out of all of the ones that I've been attending. Um, and I think that then is having a subtle impact because what we wanted to do was do this so well that people in the future would go, there was that one that was done way back at the start and they really focused on connection. They really, you know, they had music, they had poets. So we wanted to set the bar really high. And I think uh, my feeling is that we actually did that because now I'm getting a lot of people saying we want to emulate it. And so I guess that's a really good flow on that we will have subtly, subtly impacted other people's events through the hard work that we did. And, and just hats off to all of the volunteers, just so I've said it, make sure that they know it couldn't have been done without everybody who, um, who was involved. So, yeah. And just, um, just on that one, um, I, after the unconference, I've had a lot of people come to me and say, hey, can you, can you support us with an on online event or an online workshop? And so um, I'm, I'm actually doing quite a lot of tech support um, for things like a purpose workshop or a diversity inclusion workshop, where the actual facilitator doesn't actually have the capacity to, um, to manage the technology as well as deliver the content. And so for as a, as a volunteer organizer, I'm able to learn the skills and apply it um, to different communities and purpose um, purposeful um, initiatives which has been great yeah so I'll just keep running through the questions so the next one was from Chris how did people opt in and out of sessions was it the law of two feet and how do you do that on zoom yes it was the law of two feet and we had six different zoom rooms each with their own link so you literally you would leave one and you would join another um, so sometimes I get people, they're getting confused, like, was it like six breakout rooms within one Zoom account? But no, it was six different Zoom accounts. So that gives us the flexibility. Also, if we had wanted to, if it had gotten even bigger, we could have had, you know, 500 people in this Zoom room, 500 in this, 500 in that. We deliberately didn't over advertise or make it bigger because <laughs> we weren't sure how it was going to run ourselves. Um, but potentially you could go a lot bigger and have people jumping between rooms. Um, and and the, way, the way we, yeah. oh, you got it. Yeah. We made it really easy for people to find those Zoom links by putting everything on that first page of the program. So it really clearly set out what's going on, when, and how to join. Um, so having that one like point of truth to come back to was really key. Um, and I was just going to say, um, just from the connection room perspective, where the conversations were a bit more personal, uh, we found the waiting room function was really critical in terms of how we manage the ins and outs. Um, even though you can't have conversations with people in the, the waiting room area, um, it was just useful for us to be able to talk amongst ourselves whether it was the right time. You know, if all the participants were in breakout rooms, should we let this person in and tell them what's going on and see if they want to come in or not come in? And, um, so that's just functionality to be aware of that you can automatically put a waiting room on your Zoom. Yeah, that's a great point. And the other thing that I, I know I'm going to forget to say if I don't say it now, but we really did in the, each session, we used the breakout rooms really well, I think, because we would send like three or four people into the breakout rooms. So it wasn't like there's 10 people or 15 people, it was three people. So you actually got real conversations going. So I think that's really important because some people I've talked with since have said, oh, so you just had a presenter and then they talked for their time and then the next presenter. But no, we actually had like 15 or 20 minute presentations and then purposefully sending people away with a theme or a question or something that they then talked about and were able to participate. That's the key thing. So they were talking with three or four people rather than being in a room of 30 or 40 or 80 or whatever. So that was one thing I think we did well. Um, the next question was, if you did it again, what would be the first step to take care of? Um, so from my perspective, the, the reason this worked well is it really was about collaboration and partnerships. So if I was doing it again, I would start with that. You know, Who can you reach out to? Who can collaborate with you? Who can you involve and bring their expertise and their skills in? Rather than feeling like, because sometimes events are run by like, this organization, you know, this is our event. And that might be appropriate in the context, but if you can come together with others, 
you amplify your impact because they share it with their networks, they bring their expertise. So I think starting from a collaborative way of doing things is a really important element to run an event well. Does anybody else want to comment on that one though? Yeah, and getting really clear about what you want to get out of it as well, I think, at the, at the outset. So for us, that was the co collaboration, connection, and community through an online space. Um, so that was a key thing running throughout, which helps you then make your coming decisions to make sure you're aligned with that. Yeah. And then Chris had a, uh, another couple of questions. I'm just going to pick up, what did you decide, how did you decide what themes and topics were in and out of scope? Did you have a target audience? And I think the answer is that we were kind of going grassroots and saying to the crowd, what do you want to talk about? We did frame it. And so it's in the messaging, we were really clear, we're in the midst of crisis, COVID-19 is happening, what's the future that we can build? So we framed it in that way. And therefore, I think we got people submitting topics which were on point. But then I remember Erica, Jesse, and I were sitting there with all the sessions that had been chosen and we were dividing them into themes. And there was definitely sort of a social enterprise sort of cluster of topics and you know, a few other ones that we then scattered through the day to, again, to, as I think Eric had said, to help people on the emotional journey of the day to make sure that it wasn't like social enterprise, social enterprise, social enterprise. It was like other topics as well. But to, I guess to be clear, we didn't do any like rolling out of topics. So the, we just chose the top 20 as voted by our participants. So we had about 180 people vote on the um, topics that were submitted. I think we had 35 or 36 in total. So we just took the top 20 and then curated them into the timetable. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And, and it might have been that a topic that the organizing committee didn't expect could have risen to the top. And that would have been fine too. And yeah, <laughs> I think there's another one here about the, the decision-making processes for the IT platforms. And I think, I think it was, came back to our design principle of keep it simple. So for example, we knew that people knew how to use Zoom more than other platforms and we knew how to use it. So that's how we chose it. We knew how to use MailChimp. So that's how we chose it. I'd used Humanetics for a long time before. So that's how we chose it. So I guess go with what you know would be my advice. And then Michelle from Volunteer New Zealand, how much work or input did it take, hours and people? I think maybe Jesse had said there was about 60 people in the Slack channel. And then I'd say about 10 or 15 who were actively involved. And then there were people that we brought in on the day who were weavers or technicians or whatever. Um, yeah, I, as Jesse said, it was a lot of work. I think it was a unique moment in time because of the lockdown. You know, it, it wasn't a normal time. I had more time to devote to this because I wasn't busy doing my lawyer stuff or as busy. Um, yeah, but we, I haven't tried to estimate the number of hours. <laughs> and, and on that point, I, I think one of my biggest tips in terms of not skimping on people would be that any kind of hosting of any kind of online space, in my experience, needs two people minimum. Like we had teams of three in each room. We had the tech and the weaver and the the corridor starter. But I think um, trying to do the tech and the presentation uh, is is a false economy. Um, if you want to run things well, um, would be my personal opinion. Having done quite a lot of this in the last few weeks as many of us have yeah i agree and and another point is to build in rest times for the people who are on because we had kind of thought well the person in the aroha room well they'll just do the whole thing which is what we did but with hindsight we would have had breaks for the people so like erica does the first two and then i do the next one and then somebody else does the next one um, that would have been better and we'll just get through the question. So they did a good amount of people access the Google shared docs for each session. Any learnings from using this tool? I don't know the statistics, but I think they were well used on the day. I think people were actually putting their contact details. I know that at least some of the presenters have reached out to people who put their details in and are having ongoing conversations. 
because I've been copied on a few messages saying, let's catch up. We need to do this. This is great. You know, so I think it, I think it did fulfill what we wanted it to. I think one of the key parts of that, those docs is that we had a little um, table at the top, just asking people to put in their name and email if they wanted to stay in touch. So it kind of hands the, the onus back onto the individuals who do want to keep connecting. So they are empowered to be able to do that. Um, obviously being a small team of volunteers, once the event was over, a lot of us sort of needed to just step back and breathe for a bit. So to be able to just give that to the, um, to the participants and say, you know, you do what you want with this. Um, you know each other now as much as we know you um, and to, to hand it over to them was quite helpful. But maybe that's a learning as well. I'm not sure if this made it in the document, but even having like a second tier of person helping to say, look, you're helping with the post event things and having someone dedicated who actually goes out and reaches out to the Cordero starters and says, hey, do you need some help reaching out to the people? Like we probably could have helped facilitate more of that connection. Um, but I think all of us at the end, we were really just like, woof, that's done. <laughs> so um, yeah. And Dave asked um, what technical glitches we encountered, if any, as we ran the IU and how we responded to them. I, I think there were a few little things, but there wasn't anything major. I mean, my big one was I was worried as we got to 100 that we weren't going to be able to go over 100 because I hadn't set up the settings for, you know, um, having the higher numbers that can go in the Zoom call, but it was fine. Um, I think there was in one of the rooms, they took everybody off of mute and off of video so that they could clap for the poets and somebody happened to have their radio on really loud. So it, it didn't work because the radio dominated and no one could hear the other people. So maybe being careful about unmuting people um, because you don't know what's happening in the background. Did anybody else have any glitches that they knew of or? We had, we had one piece of feedback about use of breakout rooms from someone who wasn't familiar with them. And I think her camera was turned on once she entered a breakout room kind of thing. So it's just about, I guess, making sure you really communicate clearly with your participants. What does it mean going into a breakout room? Do I have to go? What's the expectation when I'm in there? Um, just to kind of, you know, accommodate everyone and when, with where they're at. Yeah. And as a, as a non particularly techie person, I really appreciated the time that Dennis and, and others put into working out the kind of uh, tech standards and Zoom settings that could be shared with the, the rest of us, like just going through all the possible options and thinking about what would work for our circumstances. And I think they're in the, the document, aren't they? Um, so it's, yeah, it's worth having somebody really bury themselves in that and be, be really sure about what's going to suit your particular circumstances the best. Yeah. Yeah. And I shout out to Dennis and the whole, all of the technical people because they were really great. And, but if you're not a technical person, ask the questions, you know, how is it, what does it mean to be a co-host? How is it going to work? How do I share my screen? Because it's better to find out that before than after. <laughs> and we did a lot of work in terms of recording, like, do you record locally? Do you record to the cloud? How do you record? We did experiments. There's a huge amount of work that's in the document. Um, and lots of practicing with each other in our own like planning calls. You were like, if I do this, can you see that? Like it's, it's worth playing with each other. So you get really confident. Yeah. yeah. And I'd like to make a comment on from as the techie person, I think that the technology has grown to such an extent that if we use the metaphor of a car, we don't need to be a mechanic. We need to be a driver. And so the learning curve um, and the obstacles overcome are much less than, than what it would have been in the past. So, I really wouldn't be put off by the fact that it's a virtual unconference using technology. It's just the experiential learning is not, um, is not a major obstacle. And once you're there, you'll be surprised at what you're able to achieve. Yeah, that's good. So then there was a question about the sense of community created, what we would do differently next time. I think we've probably covered that one. So I'll keep going unless somebody has a thought. Uh, what were the common pitfalls for new facilitators, especially in relation to being in an online space? Any thoughts on that? Maybe Erica or Jesse or one of the people, or is that maybe the questions talking about the presenters? I'm not sure. 
Yeah, I, I think probably one of the reflections was that because we moved so quickly from the voting through to the creation of the program through to the con unconference itself, there was very little time to actually sort of coach our Cordero starters through that process of online facilitation. So we lucked out in the sense that some of them were already really experienced and did a wonderful job. Um, but we definitely, as Erica said, if we spread out that time frame, added sort of four or so more days in throughout, that would give us more time to actually have a one-on-one -on -one call with each Cordero starter to be able to make sure that they're really clear on how they want their session to run, uh, what the capabilities of Zoom are, how breakout rooms work. So that's what I'd suggest, like just putting more time into that side of things. Um, and also timing, just making sure that all of our Cordero starters are really clear on, on timing and have done a practice run through because the 30 minute time slot was really tight um, for, the, for the day. And just adding to that, um, diversity and inclusion was um, a main piece of work that we wanted to um, weave in through all of the, the um, pieces. And so um, if this was to be done again, we would also um, support the Cordero starters or the facilitators to um, help them um, understand how to actually do that effectively on an online space as well. Cool. Um, I know lots of people are dropping off because of the, the time and things, but they're leaving chat messages saying, thank you so much. I'll catch up on the video later. So it just shows the technology um, that everyone appreciates that. I think there's only like two more questions, really. Um, one was thoughts towards ideal pre and post events, satellite events, events leading into and preparing. This could include retrospectives and this very session we're in. Um, any open space proposals? I mean, yeah, it, it was kind of weird, as we said, in that there was such an appetite for this that we didn't really need to focus too much on building it up. <laughs> but if you wanted to, you could definitely hold a week before or two weeks before like a pre-pre-event to get people excited and used to it and, and things. Um, we kind of did that because we had a session on the Tuesday explaining how to, how to pitch your idea. And I think we had about 80 people attend that. So yeah, I don't, I don't have any other immediate reflections though. Does anybody else? I think it's, yeah, the, the post event space probably has been mentioned before, um, but that's something that we could put more time into of doing it again. Yeah. But. And I think the, the function of this um, event was very much about the intensity of the experience. But of course, as with any type of event planning or program design, there's, there's other opportunities to kind of extend the uh, connection opportunities or deepen or develop what's gone on. And, and it, it comes down to um, time people have available. But uh, certainly the uh, experience design piece, with more time, you could flesh it out in all sorts of different ways, um, as with events that are not virtual. I think the last question I see, if anybody sees other ones, feel free, but it says, did your weavers and tech people meet up in the virtual rooms beforehand to meet each other and make sure they knew how the room worked? And I think the answer is yes. They were all connected. They were on Slack, they were connecting and then emailing and talking and making sure that things worked. And I think that is really key um, because, yeah, you just wanna have double checked everything beforehand. Yeah. And then there's, there's one from John, the value of creating the video recordings. Um, and has this caused any positive outcomes that are visible already? I think, I think it has. Um, I've definitely been able to pass the link on to other people who've gone in and watched the unconference, even though they didn't attend on the day. And I actually had people contact me before the event saying, I'd love to come, but I've got a toddler and I'm just not sure it's gonna work. And I was able to say, well, don't worry, because we're recording it. It's probably, save your $5, um, just watch it the next week in your own time. So I think the legacy of the event, we'll see, I mean, we'll be able to watch the YouTube numbers in terms of views. And so that will be an interesting metric to watch over time. But I think the, the legacy of it is that we've captured a moment in time on the 24th of April, these people got together and this is what they talked about. So it's almost like a little slice of history now. Um, and certainly if we hadn't recorded it, it would just be an event that happened that was cool, but we kind of have moved on. Um, which frankly, some unconferences 
deliberately say we're not recording we're not you know the, everything stays in the room so that is a bit different we wanted to record it so that those who couldn't attend could do so later and also as jesse i think would say you know you you listen to rooms later that you weren't able to attend because you were you were hosting you know weaving one of the other rooms cool well i think that i think we might draw a line under it pretty soon one of the things i'd like to suggest um, is that if you've appreciated this, feel free to share <laughs> with others um, because our purpose here, our Kaupapa, is to make this accessible. And we know some of you are watching this on the video, um, but hopefully you get the sense of what we're about. You know, it, it, to be honest, like I'm in awe of the team, led by Erica particularly, who assembled that document um, because there is a lot of work that's gone on into it. And so I would love to see it shared widely. Um, we've shared it with our networks, but we'd welcome you to share it with yours because that way more people can see it and hopefully we can have um, you know, a greater positive impact. So that was just the message I wanted to make sure it got out. <laughs> Does anybody else have anything else they wanted to cover or say? I think I probably speak for all of us when I say, um, feel free to get in touch like via LinkedIn with any of us if you have specific questions that delve a bit deeper into things. Um, from what we've talked about today, you can kind of see who was involved in which spaces. Um, but yeah, you should, should be able to find any of us on LinkedIn if you did want to chat about things in more detail. Great, well, thank you so much to everybody. Thank you, Erica, who really led this part of the post-conference event and assembled us. Um, we really appreciate everybody who shared all of your questions. Um, and yeah, just keep an eye out and watch out for what the future may hold. And we'll, we'll keep you updated. We plan probably to do another one, but not right away. So thank you everybody for joining. Thank you everyone.